this, oh, put this slide up. All right, we are streaming on Facebook, it looks like. Awesome. Okay, we're going to get started in like 30 seconds, <laughs> 12.59. Okay, so I think we're, we'll get started. Oh, we've got a couple of guests wanting to join. Okay, all right. So I think we're gonna get started. Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for our BD at Home. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about big bugs and Vincent's gonna be telling us all about them. Um, so just a little bit of an introduction to all the voices you're going to hear and the faces you're going to see. So uh, Vincent uh, is a museum interpreter and he will be presenting today. Uh, my name is Kashfa. I will be facilitating and answering uh, your questions in the chat. So when whenever you have a question, uh, feel free to put it uh, in the Zoom chat box. Um, before we uh, before we go on to talk about insects, I wanted to just uh, give a bit of an introduction to the Beatty Biodiversity Museum um, and do a land acknowledgement. Um, so the Beatty Museum is on the traditional unceded, unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam. Um, and uh, what you see in front of you is the flag of the Musqueam people. Um, wherever you live in BC or around the world, you can, or uh, across North America, you can figure out what indigenous territory you're on. Um, we are also here on a map. So the BD Museum is uh, at the University of British Columbia, and we've got a bunch of other museums and places to visit next to us. We're next to the Pacific Museum of Earth. We'll be at the Museum of Anthropology, um, the Botanical Garden, lots of really wonderful places to visit. Um, and the museum is open as well. We're, we're open from Tuesday to Sunday, uh, 10 to five. This is what the museum looks like uh, on Main Mall. Um, right now we're not quite this busy, uh, but you can see back there, we have our biggest specimen. We have the blue whale specimen. I'll briefly talk about it in just a second. There it is. <laughs> so this is uh, the largest specimen that we have in the museum, uh, the big blue whale. Uh, but this is just one of over 2.1 million specimens that we have in the museum. So we have lots of really cool things to see. Um, right next to the museum is actually the Biodiversity Research Center. So the museum uh, and the research center are part of the BD Biodiversity Center. And uh, there are all kinds of scientists studying biodiversity here. So uh, some of the organisms they study are, are seen on this poster. So somebody studying seahorses, somebody studying sunflowers, uh, algae, and so on. And this is what the museum looks like on the inside. So we have lots of cool specimens. This is actually right in the middle of the fish collection. And this is showing you the six different collections that we have in the museum. Um, so you can see from the top left, we've got this brown circle with a feather. This is uh, the Cohen Tetrapod collection, uh, which has birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Um, and there's a skeleton of a platypus, which is a mammal. It's a very strange mammal. Um, we have the marine invertebrates, uh, which is represented by these beautiful abalone shells. The herbarium, which has fungi, uh, sorry, which has plants and related things. So fungi, for example, are in here as well as lichens. 
uh, the Entomology Collection, uh, Fish and Fossils. Uh, and today, Vincent's going to be telling you about insects which would be found in the Entomology Collection right here. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Vincent. Um, so... hey, uh, thank you, Kashva. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're here today to look at some of our specimens in the Discovery Lab. So that's where I am now. So. Um, if you've been to the museum in person, um, maybe as a visitor, member, volunteer, you might be familiar. It's a room where we have some of our education specimens. So we've got um, a couple million uh, different specimens in the collection that are used for research purposes. So um, these are in the cabinets and they're used for um, all kinds of research, whether it's identifying, whether it's um, taking bits of them to use for samples. But those ones aren't always visible to the public. Um, we have our amazing displays. So the shadow boxes, the little cabinets with the windows. Uh, but this room I'm in actually has some cabinets that we can open up and bring out some specimens to show to visitors or for right now, show to our visitors online. So today I wanted to focus on entomology specimens. So entomology is the study of insects. And I thought, since our sort of big halo specimen in the museum is our blue whale skeleton, the blue whale famous for being the most massive animal to have ever lived on earth, um, I wanted to talk about some big bugs. So I'm not only a fan of entomology, I'm a fan of, I was gonna say etymology because it'd be a fun play on words, but it's, it's, it's really more semantics and pedantry. But what I'm talking about is what exactly do I mean by a big bug? So I'm gonna show you a big bug that we have in our collection. So this here is a Goliath beetle. It is, by some definitions, the biggest bug ever. Ever? Or biggest bug now? Okay, so what does that mean? So first, let's figure out what is a bug, right? Um, you're welcome to put in the chat if any of you have your definition of what a bug is. Um, and I'm going to kind of tell you what, to me, a bug means. Uh, to me, a bug is common word for a small creeping creature, right? Um, now, scientifically, a bug is actually a group within the insects. So insects are, um, yeah, so there's the taxonomic version of bug, but also just, yeah, it's a general word used to describe anything small. I've seen uh, books about bugs that include everything from insects to spiders to worms to snails. Um, and some of these are very different from each other. Um, so let's break it down. So let's use the scientific words. Uh, I've said the word insect a few times. So insects are animals. They've got six legs. They've got three body parts. And well, they belong to a group called the arthropods. Now the arthropods are all of those jointed armored animals, including uh, crabs, spiders, things like that. But insects have six legs. That's six, right? Yeah, six legs. Um, so right now I wanna focus on some of our biggest insects. So I'm gonna show you, I showed you the Goliath beetle. I'm gonna move the camera to show you some of our other really big insects we have here. So, ooh, sorry, make everyone dizzy for a second there. But if you see this, this is an atlas moth. Got a bit of reflection there. The atlas moth is by some definitions, one of the largest insects ever. We move on over here, we have a kind of bird wing butterfly. Now this butterfly is not considered the largest, but there is a kind of bird wing butterfly considered the largest insect ever. So how is it that this, this, and this could be considered the largest insect ever? In fact, I have a few other candidates for largest insect ever. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. <laughs> And while you're doing that, I'll just yes. uh, share some of the answers. I think you've seen them. Nicole just said that uh, she thinks of the taxonomic version of bug first yes. as well, but also small crawlies. And Nancy says the same thing, and even with her background. 
she thinks of the common usage. Mm -hmm. Also, her cat knows the word bug, which is very impressive. Interesting. <laughs> All right. Uh, so folks, can you see my slideshow? Yeah. I also just wanted to um, uh, suggest something to the participants that when Vincent is showing his, uh, the camera, you can uh, use the option of pinning um, yes. his video. Uh, and that's an option in the, in the top left corner. So you'll see it. Um, yeah, so uh, here you'll see different kinds of Goliath beetle. So I do want to clarify, when I say Goliath beetle, there's actually multiple species. And the species we have in our discovery lab um, may not actually be the biggest of them. Now, one thing to note, when I say the Goliath beetle is the largest insect, which part of big am I talking about? So remember when I said the blue whale is the most massive animal to have ever lived? It is not the biggest in every dimension. So what do I mean by that? Can anyone think of something, another animal that could arguably be considered bigger than the blue whale? Give you a hint. One of them actually lives around here as well. And they're squishy and have no bones. Uh, Nicole has suggested Patagotitan, the dinosaur. Uh, yes, so there is an ancient dinosaur who from certain estimates is longer from head to tail. Another one that I like to think of is, well, the lion's mane jellyfish. It's tentacles. Um, the longest one ever was longer than the blue whale. The blue whale's about our, the blue whale skeleton we have is about 25 meters long. The whale was 25 meters. And I think the longest blue whale ever measured was around 30, 33 meters long. There have been uh, lion's mane jellyfish estimated tentacle to tentacle over possibly 40, 50 meters long. So that animal is much less massive than a 80 to 100 ton whale, but it is longer. So in a similar vein as the blue whale being the most massive animal, our Goliath beetle takes the cake for being the most massive insect on Earth. Now, a few uh, qualifiers on that. On Earth now, there were larger insects in the past, and it actually isn't the largest in terms of mass in this stage of its life. So an adult beetle, which is the stage most people are familiar with, um, is often actually less massive than their baby form, their larva or grub. So I'm going to show you a Hercules beetle. It is another very large insect. It actually gets longer. Um, they can be about 17 centimeters in length as an adult. Um, but that thing in this person's hand there is a grub, a baby insect. So this insect is much more massive when it is a larva. Um, so the Goliath beetle larva weighs about 100 grams, so it's like an apple. Um, the Hercules beetle larva is not far behind that. The adult is maybe 3 quarters to half that mass. So in the case of beetles, they do all their gorging and eating as larvae. They turn into their pupa, which is the sort of middle stage. Uh, where they don't move, and then they emerge as adults. Uh, they might eat as an adult, but they actually don't get as massive as the baby. So big babies, uh, the, the most massive insect on Earth is most massive as a baby. Now, hey Vincent, hey Vincent mm -hmm. can I uh, just share a comment and ask a question? Of course. So there's a, a comment from, uh, from Arnold saying, I love the video of the growth development of that Hercules beetle. Yes. So that's a popular one. Um, and there's a question from Facebook. Um, for the image that you showed before, what is the scale of the, the beetles in that case? Ah, I, I yes. think that's the question. Yes. Uh, so to give you an idea, um, the one on the uh, bottom right of the screen is about the same, This the not the bottom most right, but the one next to it, the male, the larger one. Uh, so in the Goliath beetle, the male is larger. Uh, and they have this sort of prong horns, while the female just has a sort of shovel face. Um, this one here is about the same size. So you can see it's not super big. Um, I mean, it's really big for a beetle. Um, da, da, da. But yeah, so it's the larval form that's actually the most massive. Awesome. Thanks for your, thanks for that. <laughs> so, of course, the question then becomes, what's the heaviest? adult insect. So here is an image of the 
uh, little bear giant Weta. Uh, it is uh, clocked in at 71 grams, uh, which notably is less massive than the 100 gram Goliath beetle larva, but it is more massive than a 50 gram adult Goliath beetle. So it's the heaviest adult insect. Uh, so again, when it comes to playing the game of biggest insect, a lot of it comes down to um, how you define big. Um, Wetas are uh, famous for being big monsters. Uh, the special effects company that did all the monsters in Lord of the Rings are called Weta because, uh, well, they're New Zealand and they get these giant monster insects. Um, so some of the other large insects I was showing you, so I'm gonna move my camera again. We had the Atlas Moth and we had the bird wing butterfly. So bird wing butterflies in Atlas moths have the largest surface area of wings of any insect. Uh, so to give you an idea of scale, this is my hand here, and that is the Atlas moth. So the actual mass of the insect is quite small because if you can see the body in the center there, it's pretty small, but the wings take up a huge amount of space in terms of area. Um, likewise with the bird wing butterfly. There is actually a butterfly called the white witch, which has much thinner wings and has much less area, but actually has a longer wingspan. So again, there are many sort of contestants for largest insect. Now, again, I want to clarify, these are the largest insects on earth now. So when I say on earth now, what else am I referring to? Well, I'm going to show you a um, picture of some um, of an insect that's big in a very different way. Let me just get it here. <laughs> um, and yeah, and if anyone has questions or something they want to see, please let Kashva and myself know. Uh, so Vincent Nicole was asking where a bit. Weta is found in the wild, I think, did you, New Zealand, did you New say? New Zealand, and I believe there are parts of Southeast Asia as well. Cool. Is it, do you know if it's a type of cricket? Uh, it is a it? grasshopper. I'm not sure if it's considered okay. a cricket, but it is related to them. Cool. Awesome. Um, so here is a life-size uh, cutout of an ancient insect. Uh, this is... Um, sometimes called griffin flies because they aren't exactly the same as modern dragonflies, but they are related to them. I guess they were going with the theme with flying mythical beasts. Um, and this group, the griffin flies or the meganura, if you're gonna use the uh, scientific name, uh, were the largest in terms of mass and wingspan of any insect ever. So can you imagine these, now this is of course millions of years ago when we had a much different atmosphere. Um, I was actually curious on what happened to them. And it seems one of the leading hypotheses is that when Earth's atmosphere changed to have less oxygen, well, um, insects, they get their gas exchange, not through lungs, things like that, but they actually just have holes in their body to bring in the oxygen. And the bigger you are, uh, the less efficient you are at that. And so it seems with a slightly less oxygen rich um, atmosphere, these really big insects couldn't survive. Another leading um, hypothesis is, well, birds and other um, uh, predators showed up and outcompeted them for the space of relatively big aerial predator. Um, but yeah, this is a cutout of a mega nura, um, aka the griffin fly. And so there's a really good question on the opposite end of the spectrum. What is the smallest insect? Oh. I, I'm wondering if you have a guess, because I... Um, have, you put, have you looked it up already? <laughs> I have. OK, good, because I was going to uh, say, I, I want you to look it up, because I don't actually know. Um, uh, so the smallest insect, uh, according to the internet, is, is one called a fairy fly. Um, and it is a type of wasp. Oh, I was going to guess a mite or something. But. Yeah, that's a, so mites would not be technically considered insects. Right. Because they don't mm. have six legs. There you go. Um, but I do have a photo pulled up, and I will very quickly just share my screen. 
um, so everybody can see, and then I will. Please do. Sharing. Yes. Yes. Um, so, so this is it. This is the um, smallest insect, according to huh. the internet. <laughs> fairy wasp. Yeah, very small and kind of cute. So there we go. Thanks but for your question. It might be a parasite. I yes, that tends to be <laughs> the case of the small smaller. Uh, insects. I also just wanted to mention um, that Nancy has shared uh, a YouTube video of the Hercules beetle, um, one that I was Arnold was, re was referring to earlier. Yes, um, definitely check that out. Um, if you've never seen what like a beetle's metamorphosis looks like, definitely check that out. Sort of side point is, yeah, uh, insects have, uh, it's not just the butterflies that go through the multiple life stages. Um, so we talked about some of the uh, large insects. Oh, I see a question. Uh, do humans eat these giant bugs? Um, I know insects uh, do form a part of diets across the world. Um, I've never heard of uh, goliath beetles specifically uh, being uh, eaten by humans. I do know uh, the giant water bug, which is about yay big, that lives in the water, as the name implies, are eaten. Crickets are common food. Um, some ants can be common food. Um, I've had food made with cricket flour. Um, so it's high protein bread that's kind of nutty tasting. Um, although if we broaden the definition of bug, um, I eat a lot of bugs. Uh, so let's go outside of insects and go into the group they belong to. Uh, they belong to the arthropods, which are all those jointed animals. Um, the kind of uh, arthropods that um, many people might eat. So if you are a person who eats seafood, uh, you probably eat shrimp, crabs. Uh, these are arthropods. They are relatives of the insects. Um, in fact, uh, in a lot of modern uh, phylogenetic trees, uh, they group insects under a group called pancrustacea, which includes the crustaceans, um, insects, and their close relatives. So I, I always think it's interesting. People think it's it's unusual in our culture in Canada often to eat insects, but completely uh, uh, generally considered a regular part of our diet to eat uh, sh shellfish from the sea, even though pretty similar. Um, and so if you think about that, most of the shrimp and crab we eat are much bigger than a lot of the insects. In fact, uh, well, crabs are much, can get much, much bigger than insects. Uh, so if we go into the, um, arthropods, ooh, that's the wrong screen. Mm, there we go. Um, everyone's seeing the weta right now, right? Yes. All right, I wanna show you this. This is a Japanese spider crab. It is the largest modern arthropod. So um, its leg span uh, from one leg to the next is 3.8 meters. Uh, you can see this um, really old timey picture of this guy holding one. Um, but I have seen more modern pictures, ones maybe not quite as long as that one, but yes, they can get quite big. Um, so of course, um, since they live in the ocean, um, they actually can get a lot more massive. Um, anyone who's purchased seafood by mass knows, yeah, crabs, lobsters, very massive animals. Um, da -da -da. Oh yeah, um, I wanted to show this Meganura, uh, the fossil. Uh, it's 71 meters, the largest one ever found. Uh, do you mean centimeters? Did I say meters? <laughs> yes, but I, I assumed it was a slip of the tongue. <laughs> yeah, because that would be like three times longer than a whale. That's a that's a kaiju. That's Mothra. That's that what would... Godzilla is fighting. No, uh, 71 centimeters. Uh, Vincent, is it okay if I share a comment? Yes. Uh, right please. now, so uh, Jeff has shared a really uh, really great thought. Um, so the size of insects limited were limited by the type of lungs they had um, or have called book lungs and also the conduits in their legs and then at the time of the dinosaurs the earth had more oxygen in the atmosphere which enabled insects mm -hmm. to be larger at the time um yes. so I, I think the meganeura is from the carboniferous which is even before the dinosaurs but definitely the oh yeah it's even before you're right but definitely the amount of oxygen um has 
definitely has an influence on the size of insects. And I also wanted to just share something from Nancy. Uh, when we were looking at the fairy fly earlier, she said um, it wasn't that long ago that it was even named the smallest. It was less than 10 years ago, which is a good uh -huh. reminder that science keeps changing and we keep finding new, yeah, new insects. Finding new things constantly. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so I've established that big and bug are words with lots of definitions. But I want to point out what I think is the biggest bug. So let's look at arthropods, all right? Let's, let's narrow it down to arthropods, and we're going to go by most massive and longest, if we will. Um, so if we go back uh, to an ancient group called the Euryptids, um, they actually lived, um, some of them on land, actually. Um, and this is the largest arthropod ever. So if you look at that, um, you can see they're pretty big. Uh, the longest one was more than two meters long. Uh, I'll show you a fossil of one here. Uh, so these curious uh, arthropods um, were the largest arthropod ever. So um, their length is over two meters and their mass would have been probably a couple kilograms. Uh, so these are the biggest bugs from a certain uh, point of view, if you will. Um, now, of course, um, if we broaden the definition of bug to include all creepy crawlies, then, well, I guess maybe the colossal squid? <laughs> um, if, so, oh wait, I just said the there's that jellyfish that's 50 meters, so yeah, again. But let's stick to arthropods, it's the eruptids, and of course, of the modern living insects, we have the massive glide beetle larvae. And if we're looking at arthropods in general, there's that really long legged Japanese spider crab. Um, so I wanted to spend the next bit of time just sort of pointing out some cool specimens we have in our collections, if there's anything yeah. people wanted to see or other questions. Vincent, is it okay if we uh, take a minute to maybe just answer? Yes, of course, please. Things? So Nicole asked, uh, and I'm wondering if you know this, where was Meganura found? Oh. Um, Megan, your eye was found. Uh, sure. I I just did a quick Google search and Thank you. the first <laughs> one was <laughs> the first one was found in France. <laughs> France, okay. Yeah, um, and I just wanted to add something to a comment earlier when we were talking about uh, insects uh, uh, breathing. So um, we used book lungs, um, and that's what spiders have, but insects have trachea and spiracles. Um, so right, spir spiracles are the little holes on their body, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So different uh, uh, breathing mechanism. Um, and then I think you were, the image that you just showed after Euryptids, I think you were showing. Um, so Ginger is asking, where do slash did they live location? Um, again, I think they were found in a few places. I'm not sure actually where this one was. Um, I apologize. Um, I was mostly fascinated with their size. I forgot to write down um, <laughs> where the fossils were found. Um, let's see. Uh, also, uh, Vincent, do you have a favorite insect? Favorite insect? Huh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, as a kid, I was always fascinated by praying mantises. Um, I just thought they looked really cool. And, they, and I had a transformer that would turn into one. So that was like my favorite thing ever. And um, and yeah, just um, that's a really neat one. I think now learning about these big ones, I think just the idea of these really giant beetles. Um, I mean, if I, I have a favorite individual insect. Uh, there was someone who had a, a, a stag beetle named Spike, uh, who she would give little items and he'd hold them and he'd would walk around with a pen and make art. So that's my favorite individual insect. <laughs> awesome. Just so just for completion. Oh, and Nicole's put this in the chat as well. Looks like this particular Euryptid fossil was found in New York State. Oh. Which is I, very cool. I think the one thing that fascinates me is how all the plates, the tectonic plates were in such different places and the atmosphere was so different that it's it's kind of weird to think just all these places where we find fossils and how they just didn't look anything like the modern places.
very true. <laughs> okay, so does anyone have requests or things they'd... Oh, there's a question from uh, five-year-old Richard. Does this bug live in water or on land? And does it swim well? So the Eureptids, um, actually, uh, these ones uh, lived in the water because uh, they were um, arthropods uh, li lived in the water. Um, there are, um, so these ones I don't believe walked on land. There were really large like millipede and centipede ancestors that got to like over a meter long that could walk on land. Uh, awesome. If it helps anybody, what uh, the other, the common name for them is sea scorpions. So if you imagine that in your head, so <laughs> give you an idea of, uh, you know, what they would look like when they're alive and how they would be living. All right. Um, now, please uh, tell me something else you want to look at, but I'm going to point, uh, show you some specimens that I decided to pick out. I thought were pretty neat. Um, one a really cool thing that was uh, brought to us was something we got up there, that very large beetle. Um, I'm not going to be able to hear you for a second as I take my headphones off to go get it. <laughs> Uh, Karen has very graciously let us borrow her uh, Hercules uh, beetle. Uh, it's a, a model. You can see the guts inside. Um, uh, this one I think might be a little bit larger than I get, although actually, because I know they get to 17 centimeters, so actually, yeah, maybe actually it's about the right size. Um, so yeah, um, and actually we're talking about another inner bits. Um, I'm going to be honest, I'm not super familiar with anatomy, so, um, but this is a really good look um, of just, you know, a really big Hercules beetle. Um, also wanted to show, um, we were talking about the non-insects. So we have here uh, one of our most uh, popular slash unpopular specimens in the Discovery Lab. Uh, let's see. Oh, that reflection is bright. <laughs> there we go. Um, we have a tarantula. Um, now, we haven't been able to figure out exactly what species of tarantula, so if anyone is an expert in ID, that, that'd be really cool. Uh, but yes, uh, we got some big tarantulas. Uh, not as massive, though, as our uh, goliath beetle larva. Um, so you'll note uh, tarantulas and spiders, not insects. They have eight legs, uh, two body parts. Um, and one thing actually people always point out to me is, doesn't it have 10? Um, these two here are actually their mouth parts. Um, and they just kind of kind of look like legs, but they attach differently. Another cool specimen we have is a horseshoe crab. So the horseshoe crab, um, despite being called a crab, is actually not as closely related to the crabs, but is actually in its own group. Um, but if you go higher up, it belongs to the chelicerates. So actually the arachnids, like our spiders and scorpions, are actually more closely related to our horseshoe crab than the horseshoe crab is to the crab crabs. Um, and people often call the horseshoe crab a living fossil because it actually uh, resembles and is related to uh, several of those ancient giant arthropods, but it's the only one of its group left. So did anyone have any other specimens they were maybe interested in seeing? We've got a few more. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, butterflies and moth specimens. Uh, we have um, a few other ones if people want to see anything. Uh, Vincent, I just wanted to put forward a a question. It's kind of an interesting one. So what is the most medium average size insects? And, oh I'm, I'm, and I'm, yeah, I was wondering maybe like just maybe based on what you have around you, do you have any thoughts? That's like, <laughs> mm. I mean, I guess you could get the size of every known species and get their average or their mean. Um, That's, 
I don't know that offhand, nor how I would find that yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it would depend because there is such a huge, uh, such a huge range. Um, I wanted to do a personal request. I don't know if you have this out, but the morpho butterflies are always one of my personal favorites. Yes. Um, why don't I go grab some of those? Um, I think those are that is an excellent idea. I want to show. Yeah, let me just move some things around so I have some room. I'll be back in five seconds. So here is a mount with six different Morpho butterflies. Um, so they belong to uh, genus Morpho. Um, and looking at back here, that's actually six different species of Morpho butterflies. Um, two of them found in Peru, uh, two of them found in Brazil, and one in Mexico and one in Montenegro. So. There you go, six different kinds of uh, morpho butterflies. Um, none of these clock in as large a surface area, but they can get pretty big, as you can see here. Um, and they have that uh, typically fascinating blue color, although this one here, or this one here, uh, seems to be more brown. I do know most of the blue ones actually are brown on the other side of their wings, but yes, it's a great example. A good choice for one to see. Um. It looks like uh, I'm not the only person who shares the enthusiasm for butterflies. Sophia in the chat said, yes, the butterflies. So that's great. Um, there's a really good question from Tina. Uh, I've been told that scientists love horseshoe crabs because their blood is special. Um, how, uh, something about how their blood cells fight pathogens and prevent infection. Yes, that's true. Uh, would you happen to know of any other kind of big bug that is prized for their special traits? Um, oh, in regards yeah. for their potential to benefit. Yes, um, I know horseshoe crab blood has that cl like clots when there's like something wrong with, I think it's vaccines or something. Um, yeah, so they are very valuable for that. Um, in terms of other big bugs that humans value, I mean, crabs and lobsters, that's for sure. Um, I, I'm not sure what the exact market value of like a king crab or a big lobster right now is, but I know it's, I mean, it's the reason it's always fancy food. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd say those are some pretty valuable big bugs. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, Not quite a big bug, but I was definitely thinking of bees, honeybees. Mm. In every way, like the, the production of honey. Uh, I think their their um, uh, their venom I think has been used to treat uh, uh, some some illnesses, things like arthritis, asthma. Um, people use royal jelly, I think, as well. Definitely for skin care, but also for other, for ailments as well. So not a big bug, but a bug. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, there is the argument to be made since all of them, except for the queen, are sterile. They're really more extensions of the queen. So the whole hive is one big bug. <laughs> oh, that's a really good point. That's a good I mean, point. It's a colony. It's not an individual. But again, that is another very valuable. Um, and of course, I mean, they're all incredibly valuable in their parts in um, our ecosystems. Um, so I mean, some of the bugs we don't think about, so like the worms beneath our feet, um, a lot of beetles that uh, consume uh, detritus and uh, eat dead things are very valuable for recycling nutrients. Um, yeah, so like, I mean, here at the museum, um, we have the dermestid beetles. Uh, they're just small little black beetles. They, uh, they eat uh, decaying flesh. So uh, here we use them to clean uh, bones and skeletons. So any birds or mammals, things you see, the bones, uh, some dermestid beetle uh, would help clean that up. So that's a useful uh, trait. Uh, Richard is, uh, is is saying Ant-Man, just referring to Ant-Man, the superhero. Yeah. yeah, I mean, 
yeah, I mean, I guess if you're Ant Man, ants are pretty valuable. They help you fight crime and supervillains, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it is really interesting that as humans, we we sometimes see insects as pests. For example, a lot of mm -hmm. people, you know, um, focus on that, but um, they also provide us lots of benefits. And even if they don't, they're just really cool. Yeah. Um, there's just a lot of insects. Uh, do you see the next question, Vincent? Uh, let's, let's see. So roughly, roughly what percentage of insects uh, are venomous? Oh. And maybe we could hear a little bit about toxic versus Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, so I'm sure uh, if you're tuning in to be at home, you've probably heard something about the difference between poison and venom. Uh, so uh, venom essentially enters your bloodstream to cause damage. So often it's applied by sting or bite. Uh, poison, um, if it basically kind of makes contact with your skin or you, or you um, consume it, um, enters your digestive system, they can harm you. Um, so there are several insects that are uh, poisonous uh, that when eaten can cause damage. Um, and venom, so the most famous are probably bees, wasps, uh, ants, some ants sting, some ants bite. Um, most of the venomous insects are within uh, the Hymenoptera, so that's the order that bees, wasps, and ants belong to. In fact, I think most of the venomous insects are in there. I know there's like assassin bugs, things that can bite. But as far as I want to say most of them are hymenopterans, I'm sure there are plenty examples outside of that. Because um, I know the largest group in terms of uh, number of species are the beetles. And they're not really known for being venomous. Uh, some are poisonous to eat. Um, some might have noxious like chemicals they release to uh, detract um, to scare away predators, but not really known for being venomous. Uh, that's a that's a good point. Um, so, and just to put it into perspective, like uh, Hymenoptera, bees, wasps, ants are uh, they're about half as many as beetles. Still a lot. <laughs> um, so, um, also, it it seems like so. This is uh, uh, about. Of about 1.2 million described species, only about 100 species bite or sting. Oh. So that's, that's interesting. It's a lot less than I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, so this is from, uh, from one of our experts. Uh, Nancy's sharing, caterpillar spines can be considered venomous if they pierce. Ah, yes. Um, plenty venomous spines. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really great question from, from mm -hmm. Tina. Uh, a lot of bugs are structurally blue, as in they don't actually have blue pigment and rely on microscopic structures to appear blue. But are there any cool bugs that actually have blue pigment in them? I mean, so yeah, uh, the morphos, uh, it's basically the way they reflect light. Um, we've had a few training sessions about this, and my brain still has a really hard time wrapping around the physics of it. Yeah. But I do know it's the way they reflect. And if you actually look under it in the, with like a black light or something, it won't show up with any blue. Um, so yeah, structural color, like with bird feathers. Um, I don't know if there's, I mean, there are beetles and things that have blue on them, but I don't know if that's also just reflective or not. Blue is a really uh, difficult color to produce in nature and, and generally across uh, the animal kingdom, and even even within plants, it's yeah. a really rare mm -hmm. color. Um, so I I don't I also can't think of any off the top of my head that uh, would have. There's one suggestion just within the comment, I guess a type mm -hmm. of. Hmm, I there might be like an odd beetle or something that might have it, but blue is a very difficult color to produce. Yeah. It's almost it's um, almost always structural. That's my understanding as well. And again, uh, one of the rules in biology is there's always exceptions. <laughs> very, very true. Um. Oh, I see something about spiders and silk. So um, I am not an arach 
arachnologist, is that aeronologist? Uh, but uh, spiders, they have spinnerets, which are um, on the rear, on the back of their abdomen, they have a um, little, little, little section that uh, creates, uh, that shoots out, it doesn't shoot out, it emits the silk. Um, so yeah, inside the body of the organ that sort of synthesizes the silk. Um, it comes out from there. Um, a few things to note, um, not all spiders make the sort of classic webs that we think of as uh, so like the classic, like Halloween webs. Uh, uh, the orb weavers are a group of spiders uh, who specifically make that kind of pattern. Uh, there are other kind of spiders that make sort of more just clumpy, uh, what we call cobwebs. Others uh, don't even build uh, webs, they actually build burrows and traps. Uh, so tarantulas, for example, um, often don't really build webs. Uh, if they do use their silk, it's usually um, much less, um, sometimes simply just for like egg cases. I know jumping spiders use it as a little like repel line, so they'll attach it and then jump. And then as a thing so they can return back if it, they want to go back. I always thought that was fun. Um, so Spider-Man, I mean, someone mentioned Ant-Man earlier, made me think of this. Classic Spider-Man, of course, is a inventor and creates a spider silk-like thing. Uh, but the Tobey Maguire who shoots it out of his wrists, um, I mean, I guess the equivalent of our, I mean, our abdomen's here. So be like out of your butt or something <laughs> if you want to shoot silk from the same place a spider shoots it. So I just wanted to comment on a previous uh, question. So just about the blue pigment. Um, so Tina had mentioned Nisea, which is, uh, it's a genus of blue morphos and they do produce blue pigment. There's also one butterfly, it's called the olive wing. Uh, and uh, it is one of the very few insect species on earth that produces a blue pigment. So what you said earlier, Vincent, is completely true. There's always an exception. Right. <laughs> That's the only thing I'm ever confident when I'm talking about biology is I'm sure there's an exception. <laughs> there you go. Uh, there's a good question in, uh, about ladybugs. Uh, yes. Do they only, um, I guess, do they only flap their inner wings or do their inner wings only flap when they're flying? Ah, so yeah. Uh, so ladybugs are a kind of beetle. There are hundreds of thousands of kinds of beetles. The ladybug is one of the more famous uh, groups of those, uh, but like most beetles, they can fly. Um, and so insects with wings typically have four. Uh, so on a beetle, there are the um, elytra, which are the front set of wings, which have adapted to become this hard armored part. And then behind them, they have their flying wings. So when they are not flying, they will close the elytra down and these wings will actually fold up underneath. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a very complicated process in which they will pull them and fold them underneath. But yes, when they're flying, it's just the flying wings and the elytra kind of just stick up and out of the way. So as you can imagine, uh, this wing setup is not quite as agile as say um, a fly or a bee, which of course have much more agile wing setups, but um, of, of course, the adaptation for beetles is uh, trade um, the extreme speed for and maneuverability for, well, armor when you're not flying. So yes, uh, that was my really long way of saying, yes, it's the under wings that flap, not the top ones. Perfect. Uh, there's another question about ladybugs. And actually, Vincent, just behind you is a ladybug poster. It's like perfectly above your head oh, on the nice. wall. <laughs> uh, Ginger has a question. Why do ladybugs have a red color with black dots? Oh. Um, now, that specific pattern, I don't know. I know that a bright red color um, is often a warning. Um, so there are warning colors, so oftentimes toxic um, animals will advertise themselves. Basically, I'm not hiding because I'm letting you know, don't eat me, it will, it will not be good for you. Uh, and so many ladybugs are uh, poisonous um, and they can actually emit foul odors uh, if disturbed. Uh, so if you ever poke at a ladybug, don't do that. But if you were to um, and you smell something nasty, it probably the ladybug. So I'd imagine the red color probably 
um, is a big part of that sort of warning coloration to their predators. Yeah, is it is it okay if I jump in? That's a, so that's very true. So the red color. Um, I just wanted to share my screen for a second and show everybody uh, a page on our um, uh, on the museum's website. So. As, uh, in the museum, we do uh, yes. we do we have specimens for research and databasing. So this is the page of our uh, Spencer entomological collection, and a lot of our specimens are are, are photographed and database. So I'll just go back so you can see these are these are just all beetles, um, but we have other types of insects represented as well, so cockroaches, earwigs, and so on. Um, and within beetles, I've actually I'm going to open the group that has ladybugs, uh, which is this one, Cochineal Day. And I'll just scroll down so you can see the variety of ladybugs, OK? So we've got this one that's kind of orangey with two spots. We've got uh, we've got a black one with orange spots. We've got one no with spots. no spots. We've got one with the spots look kind of like lines. Um, the, the spots have a lighter color ring around them. I'll just slowly keep scrolling down so you can see. And this is a resource that you can explore by yourself as well. I'll put the link uh, in the chat box. Um, so uh, you can see that the image that we have of ladybugs is, is you know, uh, is the one that Vincent has on the wall behind him. Uh, but not all ladybugs, you know, there's, there's a variety. So anytime we see something that looks like this outside, we'll say, oh, that's a ladybug, but actually it might be. Uh, quite different. So uh, I just wanted to share this because this is a really cool resource. And if you need, if you want to look at um, uh, really HD photos of, of insects, you're welcome to uh, check out our database. So stop sharing. Yeah, um, actually, it's a good point with the ladybugs. Um, yeah, the common alka. I, I remember there was one story I'd often hear as a child that um, that ladybugs would get more dots as they aged. That is not true. Uh, different species have a set number of dots, and um, the dots you see are just that species. And if you see one with more dots, it's a different species. Um, Vincent, there's a few uh, more questions mm -hmm. uh, and just things that people have shared. Um, so Tina shared a, a video, a National Geographic video about uh, on how ladybugs fold their wings. Which is great. Yes, I was I was looking for that earlier, um, but someone awesome. found it for me. Excellent. Awesome. Um, uh, Arnold is saying, in general, is being a bigger size more advantageous for insects? Mm. Well, I mean, relative to life on Earth, it's hard to say if insects are big or small because to us they seem small, but to a lot of other organisms, like microscopic organisms, they're pretty big. But I mean, there's always advantages and disadvantages to any adaptation. And I'd say insects seem to have carved out a niche, a really big niche around the world, where pretty small seems to be where most of them are. There are, of course, the outliers like our Hercules beetle, Goliath beetle, Atlas moth. But yeah, um, for arthropods, I know size is more limited than for uh, like vertebrates. One of the big things is as you get bigger and bigger, uh, the heavy armored body uh, becomes so heavy it can't support its own mass, while um, a, a vertebrate uh, with bones, uh, it, uh, just the physics, the biomechanics. Um, and again, also where you're found. So if you're in the ocean, uh, gravity affects you less because there's buoyancy in the water. So that's why lobsters get more massive than uh, insects on land, why the blue whale is so much more massive than mammals on land. Um, so I'd say being bigger is not necessarily better um, in and of itself. That's a good point. Uh, there's a question from Damien. Are worms bugs? Yeah. So uh, they are not arthropods. So arthropods are the jointed invertebrates. Uh, so by jointed, I mean they've got like that armor that has like joints like a suit of armor, right? Uh, worms uh, don't have that. Uh, now, there are many kinds of worms. In fact, uh, of the 20 or so different phyla of animals, so phyla is the sort of biggest grouping within animals. Um, within the, of the 20 or so phyla, half of them are called something worms, the, the, the flat worms, the round worms, the uh, peanut worms, the 
I think like, and then there's the segmented worms. Uh, so earthworms, for example, belong to that. Many marine worms are segmented worms. And they do have sections like an arthropod, uh, but they don't have the armor around them. Uh, there is something called a velvet worm, which typically gets um, its own phylum all to itself. Although I've seen some things argue it's actually very close to the arthropods and maybe. Um, so that worm is potentially. Uh, and of course, to confuse matters, there are several insects that get called something worms. So for example, glow worms are actually just uh, fireflies as a larva because their larva is a grub. Um, and fireflies are actually beetles, so. Great answer. Um, there's a question that uh, was asked earlier, but I'll ask it again in case you mm -hmm. change your mind. What's your favorite insect and why? <laughs> um, I'm gonna stand by Spike the beetle for individual insect as my favorite. Um, as for just kind of insect, I, I'm gonna take back Praying Mantis, because Praying Mantis has the very uh, sort of simple metamorphosis where the baby mantis looks like the adult. I'm always a fan of insects that look drastically different throughout their stages. So of course, uh, butterflies in their caterpillar stages often get a lot of the, uh, of the fame. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to show, um, so there's a species of ladybug here, and next to it is its larva. Um, so not quite as cuddly looking as a uh, adult ladybug, but um, yeah, baby um, ladybugs, the grub looks like that. And I always find it fascinating um, and a really neat adaptation where the larvae are very different. They focus uh, on eating. So all their adaptations are about getting as much food as possible. Um, and then they morph to their adult stage, which often has much higher focus on, well, uh, reproducing. Awesome. That's a really cool one because sometimes uh, I remember the first time I saw ladybug larva out and about uh, and I had no idea <laughs> that yeah, it would turn it's... into a ladybug. Um, awesome. So Tina has shared a link for Spike the Beatles Facebook page. So thank you for doing that, Tina. All right, um, just as a heads up, Spike has since passed on. He um, lived a couple of years, which is pretty typical for a beetle. Um, um, his children, though, are the now stars of the page. So just so you know. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so we've got, uh, it's 155. So we've got a couple more uh -huh. minutes. Does anyone have any last questions? Or Vincent, is there anything else that you wanted to share? Um, maybe for one final image, I want to show. We have this really great um, display of beetles. Now I'm going to have to move things around to get a better view of it. But give me a second here. Put that there. <laughs> if anyone has any last questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. Right. This is one of my favorite dis, uh, things we have in our discovery lab. It's a giant beetle made of beetles. Um, and I think it's just a great example of that diversity. And here, size, scale. Um, and yeah, uh, some of them are pretty big. Some of them are kind of the sizes we're used to seeing here. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's just always fun to see all the different kinds. Um, this one here, uh, sometimes called a June bug. Uh, this I find is probably the biggest of the beetles I've seen around here. Um, but yeah, of course, not as big as that Hercules beetle or of course that massive Goliath beetle found around the world. Um, since I think the beetles are far more charismatic than my face, I'm gonna use this as my final screen. <laughs> but if anyone else had any questions or comments, uh, yeah. Now we've got a few thank yous. And thank you everyone for joining me. Um, yeah, like I, I, I'm not an entomologist by trade, but I find them very interesting. And it's really cool working here at the Beatty Museum because I get a chance to learn so much. And even more exciting is I get to show all of you these crazy cool uh, 
big bugs, small bugs, medium bugs. Uh, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Awesome. All right. Uh, so yeah, once again, we've got lots of thank yous. Um, Richard is saying we missed the Discovery Lab. Uh, I can definitely understand that. <laughs> uh, we also miss showing everybody the cool specimens in the Discovery Lab. Um, just wanted to say uh, one last thing before we wrap up. Uh, we do BD at Home uh, every single week, uh, every Wednesday at 1 p.m. And next week, continuing with the insect theme, we're going to learn about uh, wasp nests with, uh, with uh, Nancy Lee. Um, and for our, you're actually gonna go through and see what you would find in a wasp nest. So uh, I encourage you, if you would continue to learning about insects to join us next week. Um, but uh, other than that, thank you. Thank you for, uh, thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Vincent, that was awesome. <laughs>